people that was 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 dealing with the unknowable and the mm -hmm. unknown, and especially today in our uh, in a period of time when we have we value rationality very highly, we have trouble, I think, kind of understanding what happens beyond the limit, whether you say certain things are intrinsically unknowable or they are potentially knowable, but we don't know them yet because we haven't got the science or the intellectual tools to do that. And the novel is populated by characters who have different relations to this, this question, this, this sort of profound spiritual question, I suppose. You yeah, I mean, it's, compared, it's been compared to Cloud Atlas in the way that it jumps through time and space, but then ties it all together. And in a way, I would say it's a search for, a prof for the profound. I mean, it's it's a it's a less neat book than than yes. Cloud Atlas. David is a very he's a very neat writer. Like he was troubled by uh, yes. the I mean, famously he was he read the Calvino mm -hmm. book, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveller, which right. Uh, right. St keeps starting yeah. stories and then and then doesn't finish them, giving you this sort of mm -hmm. sense of narrative frustration. And uh, bless him, he decided to write a book that would then finish all the stories that he wanted um, to start yeah and, and my my project is is similar in the in that it, it does as you say jump around in time and uh, to time and space but i'm very interested in the gaps mm -hmm. and 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 what happens in the silence so there are lots of events in this novel which don't take place on the page and which i hope it, it's pleasurable for the reader to to jump from one place to the next and try and reconstruct what may have happened mm -hmm. off the page or may have mm -hmm. happened in between and that and in a way it was my sort of formal attempt to try and mimic this this idea of this mm -hmm. feeling of unknowability and this feeling of certain things which we we cannot speak of you know there must we remain silent so um i'm actually going to uh, because the title is gods without men and i think that there is this whole thing of the sacred and the profound i'm going to bring this to vikram who's novel was called Sacred Games, which was actually about Bollywood and the underworld. So why did you choose the word sacred for that? Um, uh, so in the book, uh, it's a sort of, I guess, a meta comment on the idea of the detective story. Mm -hmm. And I should point out that um, several academics have argued, I think, quite persuasively that the detective story is the only really quite modern form of fiction. Right, it's so interesting that, because I was on, uh, I mean, my novel is a mystery yeah. novel, and just before this, I okay. came from a right. talk which said the discreet charm of the, the <laughs> voice. And I was thinking, like, what's so discreet about it? Right. So. Well, so <laughs> what these guys are getting at is that, you know, if you look at uh, travel stories, coming of age stories, love stories, um, stories about discovery of the self and the landscape, you find analogs for all of those in the medieval and classical world. Mm -hmm. But the detective story is, comes out of the Enlightenment, right? And if you think about the form of a detective story, you always start with a dead body, which is to say a sign that cannot be explained, right? It's inexplicable. And then the detective, usually an outside specialist, is called in to direct the scientific vision, mm -hmm. which provides an analysis first. It's a fact-finding. You find the symptoms, as it were, or the clues, and then you construct a theory, which then gets proved to be true, and therefore the universe is restored to order. Right? That which was inexplicable has now been made explicable. And which is why they're so comforting and why you can spend 24 hours a day watching detective stories, right? SVU has been running now for, what, 20 years, right? Because I think it's our modern faith that logic and rationality will lead us towards enlightenment, right? Towards the discovery of that which can be known. So I was very interested in this idea. So the book also, apart from being uh, I hope an absolutely bang up entertaining gangster story is is also a story in which you get no certain solutions at the end right so it 's sacred in the sense that everyone in the story is looking for meaning and for pattern and trying to understand the world and their own place in the world um, and whether they find it or not is one of the interests of the book uh and then we have Kalyan, who actually his book that he is writing right now called Reign of Stones, not to be confused with Game of Thrones, is, uh, has, uh, <laughs> or you can confuse it, I mean, why not? I might uh, actually change the name now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Confusion is always good. It's set actually, he says, uh, there's a visionary in it who's uh, an Islamic visionary, so there's religion in there also, and the sort of 
transforming power of what we cannot understand. And it's set in uh, what is now Somalia in the 19th century, and I'll let you take it from there. Uh, yes, since the, I'm writing the book and will be finished in December, let me not talk about that, but just muddy the waters a little bit. Go for it. Um, <clears throat> Vikram just said, uh, uh, I think very eloquently, that uh, the uh, uh, detective story is a 20th century form because we start with a dead body. But think about, uh, about uh, Buddha, uh, Gautama Buddha, discovering the uh, existence of the old man and, uh, and then finally uh, a dead body and, and realizing uh, that here is the beginning of a story and then he does not have a definite solution. He has very many indefinite solutions about how to live. Um, that is a kind of detective story that has not been finished writing. We are still in our own lives all writing that particular story. Also, to further muddy the waters about who worships whom, I'm reminded of a beautiful story by uh, Bibhuti Bhushan Bandopadhyay, the same man who wrote the Apu trilogy, which Ray made into f films. In his in his slim novel about the last of the forests in eastern India, Aranok, out of the forest, he describes this tribal man, this, this Adivasi who's dying, and with him will die a religion. With him die, will die the wisdom of his people, of the forest, of that particular god who used to be the god of the forest. His name was Tarbaro. And as this man will die, so will die a culture, a language, and a god. So we see, we and the gods, in a sense, are not different. We create our gods, men and women, as surely as women create us, men. And therefore, our stories are never really completed. Uh, one thing, you said we create our gods just as Women create men? Yes, we Explain. give birth to them. Um, well, um, each culture discovers its own God. For example, mm -hmm. in the Islamic tradition or the Judeo-Christian tradition, there are declarative sentences in, for example, the, the uh, uh, Genesis in the old uh, uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, this is how man was created and then woman was created and so forth. In the most ancient, I was just saying this a little bit earlier in the previous uh, 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 you know, session, that in the Nasadiya hymn, which is one of the oldest hymns of Hinduism, it ends, it's a series of questions and it ends by saying that that God who created, if he exists, who was he created by? Does he know about the process of creation? And then ends by saying, perhaps he does not. So the whole process of creation itself is not understood and therefore necessarily incomplete. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vikram, just talking on, since we are sort of on the spiritual. Uh, As we tend to be. Yeah, we sort of have slipped into that. And I think that's very appropriate for Boulder, Colorado in a way. Um, you, when we were talking yesterday, you kind of said something about, and to jump to politics a little bit and off topic, uh, is that the... Uh, spiritual has been ignored from the liberal debate, more or less, and why are we actually leaving it only to the right? Right, so I should set up the context for this. We were having an impassioned discussion Earlier, about yeah. current political and cultural directions that yeah. things are happening in India right now. So what I was saying to Nayana was that it's interesting to me that it's a kind of global problem of, for the left, is that the left seems incapable of using the language, the imagery, and the mythologies of religion um, and of the sacred, right? So except for liberation theology in South America, I can't think of very many other places where that vocabulary has been taken. And so what happens time and time again in different political contexts is that the right always ends up taking possession of that landscape which is really unfortunate, right? Because if you think we were talking about Kabir earlier today, um, any of those medieval Indian singer poets I, I would have, you know, it's very clear to me that if they lived today, they would be way on the left, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's particularly in the Indian context, it's really unfortunate that, uh, that 
even to this day, for the most part, we don't actually own any of that territory and we leave it to be possessed by my political uh, Purva Pakshis on the right, right? The, the, the I would say that in America too. In America too. And I mean, in particularly, I'm interested, as Nayana said, in the Sanskrit language. And um, there is this impression that I grew up with and that still per pertains a lot within the Indian political context that Sanskrit is a Brahmanical possession. And that is absurd. It has not been true for 2,000 years. Um, the Buddhists worked hugely in Sanskrit. The Jains worked in Sanskrit. Tantra gurus wrote things in Sanskrit that would turn any Brahmin's hair white, right? Um, and so it's absurd that, that, that we allow Sanskrit, for instance, to be instrumented and remade into this possession of, of a certain kind of cultural mission. Um, and my friend Arvind Krishna Mehrotra is sitting here and I'm going to involve him in this discussion. Um, I read an interview with him in Caravan, I believe it was, where in the context of the question in India today of whether we should teach Sanskrit across the schools, Arvind said something like, uh, he, I absolutely think we should teach every child in India Sanskrit because if they knew Sanskrit and they could actually read the ancient texts and the classical medieval texts, they would understand what a fiction uh, is being made about what India is supposed to be. So I think it's, uh, in, in historical terms, I think to leave the past, right, to leave these languages, not just Sanskrit, but Telugu and Tamil, Marathi, Maharashtri, all of these to the right is, is tactically and strategically an insanely bad move. Hari? Um, I mean, we, we're sort of, there are several slightly separate issues here. I mean, one of, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, in the, in, the, in the English socialist tradition, there's a strong element of, of Protestant Christianity there and Methodism and so on, nonconformist Christianity. So left traditions have in the, in the past made use of a kind of ethical position coming out of, out of that form of Christianity there. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not a religious person. I identify as an atheist, although clearly I have an interest in spiritual questions. And, I, and I, I don't see that as a... Uh, as, as necessarily a conflict, but I am I'm very interested in uh, one's ability to to claim an ethical position based on skepticism and, and doubt, and to say to, to see that as a strongly ethical position rather than a sort of negative. You know, very often people who are faithless are are, are really really presented as, as being ethically unmoored because they don't have the certainty of a, of, of, of a religious sort of grounding for, for their beliefs. But I, I, I strongly feel that uh, you can have an ethics based, uh, based on a sort of mo the sort of modesty that comes with, with not knowing, with, uh, with, with so not, how, not asserting a, a single uh, definite idea. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a very undervalued uh, position in our, uh, globally at, at the moment, you know, whether, whether or not it's appropriate for left politicians to, to appropriate the, the religious traditions of wherever they're operating. I mean, that's for, that's for individual people. I would, I imagine it works if you believe and it doesn't work if you, if you're just faking it, but, uh, yeah, and it also it. opens it up to a wider discourse. Right. And I should, yes. I, I just, sorry, sorry, sorry please. Go ahead, please. I, I just want to say that, that skepticism is the ground mark of, I mean, the Indian tradition is really vast and it's very old. So to say anything singular about it is to make a mistake, but I will say that skepticism is the base on which everything is, is built, right? So there's a famous saying in Sanskrit, vade, vade, jayate, tattva bodhaha, from continuous discussion emerges knowing of the essence, right? So debate has been the engine of knowledge production in India for thousands of years. Debate has been the way that knowledge has been tested, that it has been constructed. And so this absurd idea right now that is being promulgated, and it's actually enshrined in our penal code, that if I say something that hurts you, your feelings, whatever those feelings might be, that you can actually bring me to court and then make me, you know, spend five years in court and maybe send me to jail is insanely anti-traditional. So is this sort of recent really terrifying trend of rationalists being actually murdered because they say something rude about Hinduism, right? I mean, I'm an idol worshiper, but if you insult my idol, 
it's me who's insulted, not the idol, right? And so we've recently had a very prominent South Indian intellectual who was killed, yes. and then um, in his own house by these people who walked in pretending to be students and shot him in the head because he had said something about against idol worship on a television program. So I think these are terrifying trends which are actually completely against the spirit of the tradition that they pretend to defend. You know, yes, excellent point. Uh, I, I think that the, the language of the debate became so desiccated, you know, in the last century, starting with Julian Huxley, when he was defending the ideas of Darwin and so forth, and yet saying that these ideas were not anti-religious, they were a-religious, it had nothing to do with religion. And in doing so, he had to sort of drain his language almost of metaphors and so forth, and it became a set piece of the way in which the rational mind must speak. It became without poetry. It became burdened by that, uh, uh, you know, responsibility for being, uh, not calling that world, be that as it may, you know, I'm also reminded of some of the debates that go on in India. And they leave out, as Vikram, you so rightly pointed out, you know, the whole lokayat, you know, that entire way of thinking is thrown out. If they read lokayat, the BJP would run. Because Devi Prashad Chattopadhyay, one of the great Marxists, uh, professor of philosophy, the translator of Lokayat, who has written such a lot, you know, explicated that in Lokayat, the, one, of the, one of the most important things is that the whole idea of God or Godhead is, is, is sidelined and the whole idea of ethics and humans and our responsibility and connections and social ethics about how society is worked out and what are the rights and wrongs of those and the uses to which religion and quote caste system is also put into is ruthlessly examined in Sanskrit by the Lokayat philosophers. This is seldom referred to by the so-called religious right. I refuse to call them religious, and I refuse to call them right. <laughs> so, so to pull you all gently away from politics for a moment. <laughs> Are we describing the human condition? <laughs> <laughs> to forces that fuel your fiction. That is part of my guidelines to talk to you about today. And I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to start with Hari on that side. Uh, Actually, forget forces that fuel for you. I want to ask you one simple question. All of you all have written great epics that move across time and space and in times that you have not lived uh, and you've used history in the Impressionist notably uh, as well as in, to shoehorn into a story about a person who moves through time. So um, how, do you, how are you able to keep the two together if that's not too broad? Question. You mean the historical and the yeah? How do you show one? So one feels for the small man and for the for the understand at the same time doesn't detract from the story. But I, well, I I believe one of the great strengths of the novel is is its ability to deal with systems and to mm -hmm. deal with uh, with units beyond personal experience. And um, I mean, it's it's an advantage it has, say, over conventional narrative mm -hmm. film in that. Fiction can uh, it can do interior life. You can you can kind of pull out Jump and 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 and, yes. and and go in and there. So there's this there's this extraordinarily uh, fluid formal uh, formal thing, the novel, um, which makes it very useful for placing individuals, characters into mm -hmm. into larger contexts. And I am interested in social forces and historical forces in the technology and so on. These kind of larger things that that uh, shape human lives mm -hmm. and I, I find the novel a very useful vehicle for exploring that as a sort of intellectual vehicle for doing that. Absolutely. It's the purest form in a way because it's just Words. It's pure because it's impure. I mean, the novel is a baggy monster. Yeah. I can't remember who's, who's, right. who said right. that firstly, right. but it's right. a, it's never ever going to be rigorous in in the way that that sort of modernism would would like. You know, the, it, there's no no uh, novel is ever going to be as formally pure as a, a Mark Rothko mm -hmm. painting. You know, novel novels get mixed up in things. Mm -hmm. It gets mixed up in. Uh, the concerns of the the time they're written, it gets mixed up in 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 the 
the, the sort of forest of, of meanings that each word has in, in the language. So you are, you're inevitably writing in the middle of something and in a, in a kind of tangled up way. And I think the uh, attempts to purify the novel are misguided in, in that, to that extent. Uh, and um, in terms of characters, now Nabokov said famously that his characters are all galley slaves. They don't, he, they do exactly what he wants. Whereas, I mean, I find, thankfully, that my characters start moving on their own and sometimes refuse to do things that you want them to do. Um, how do you feel about that, Kalyan, I think? That's when the story is going well. When uh, <laughs> they tell you what to write and you do not, you're, you're, you're blessed, you're in the zone. You're not pushing the story forward. And if the story becomes uh, complicated and difficult, then, you know, just obey it. There is no other better way to do it. Um, but what is a story? It is a magic carpet that lets me go to places that I would never be able to go to. Okay. How could I go to Ireland when it was sinking during the 1840s in slowly into famine and they didn't understand what it was about? I mean, one does research. I read all the books, believe me, that were written before the famine in Ireland about Ireland and its potato production, what they thought about potato. There is a book about it, believe it or not. And potato is spelled the way, with an E, <laughs> that the poor vice president <laughs> aspirant did. <laughs> but there it is. Uh, and, he but right. he, he was right. And he he was, and he well, lost the election. Or? He, of course, did. He was too pretty to win it. Um, and he couldn't type. Uh, uh, anyway, the point is that, uh, uh, you know, no matter how much research you do, uh, it's important to do research, uh, especially if one is writing about the 19th century in The Impressionist. You did some very beautiful, you know, work. I wonder how much research went into it. And Vikram, of course, we know about his books. They live because the kinds of interviews that he does, and, and that is a form of research that is amazing, to read through the words of people that you hear. But nonetheless, ultimately, there is the story which is a very strange, rough beast slouching towards you, okay? <laughs> and to control that, well, if you're lucky, you do. Well, I, I was on a panel last night with two historians. Which panel were you not? Yeah, yeah that's I true. I want to know this. <laughs> I, <laughs> He's been, been on almost every panal. So with these historians, who, who's uh, very good historians, whose books I really admire, one who writes about Mao and the other who has written about Stalin, and they were talking about having empathy for the monster that you're writing about. And afterwards, I was thinking that for the fiction writer, it's actually a little, little different than just empathy, right? Because it's not that just you're looking from the outside in at this person and trying to have some sort of sympathy for his or her position. Um, I mean, for me, in my Cops and Gangsters book, I went and met Cops and Gangsters, and these are people who live in some pretty brutal conditions on both sides. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking right now of this one day in Bombay where a friend of mine and I met these three 20-something uh, it was a team of freelance hitmen that we took to a hotel in North Bombay, and we spent the full day plying them with liquor and food and asking them questions. And it was really interesting, and you can imagine it's like bizarre, and they're, they're really funny, and one of them especially was really smart. Um, he was self-reflexive. He wanted to know why I was writing this book, what is it going to be like, and he was a yoga-doing vegetarian hitman. No. <laughs> No. He was, right? And so, so I finally had to ask him. I said, you know, look, I don't mean to piss you off, really, but, <laughs> but I have to ask, you know, uh, how do you justify what you do? You get a phone call, you wait at a bus stop for some poor sucker, you walk up behind him, you put two bullets in his head, and then you leave. And he said, well, he had a very ready answer. He said, oh, it's written, <laughs> right? The uses it's of religion. Religion, exactly. That, that, you know, the play has already been cast. I have to do my part. He's doing his part. He's Arjuna. He's Arjuna, exactly. And it was, exactly, it was brilliant, right? And, and obviously a really easy way to get out of personal responsibility. But so here's my monster, right? I come home, but I can't just describe him. I have to somehow make him come alive, especially if I'm going to write Ganesh Gaithonde and do it from a first-person point of view, 
right? So I have to search inside myself for some part of me that is, uh, all the parts of me that are, that are ethically slippery, that are full of ferocious rage, that want money and, and you know, whatever <laughs> else. And then I have to sort of slowly breathe life into them and make them come alive. And, and then inhabit that from the inside. And when you do that for eight years, I'm sorry, I have to use this language, it really fucks you up, right? <laughs> and uh, Frederick Bush, who's an American writer, has a really marvelous book about the writing profession, which he calls A Dangerous Life. And he argues very well, I think, in that, that it's dangerous because once you bring these apparitions alive inside yourself, you can't easily put them back to sleep, right? You can't just get rid of them when you finish writing the book. And this is why writers fiction writers and poets are such messed up, alcohol imbibing, <laughs> drug imbibing, unstable freaks. You know, it's terrible to live <laughs> with somebody who does this for a living because you never know what you're getting. <laughs> Is that why you moved to Geek Sublime? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It's, I have to say nonfiction in some ways for me was a much easier way to live than to write fiction. I have to, uh, Kalyan, uh, yeah. Yeah, one, uh, just brief because they're telling me time to throw oh, it sorry, open. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Oh, five moments. I'm sorry, I misread the cue because I couldn't read the five. I could. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, very, very briefly. Uh, my novel, No Country, deals uh, with uh, starting with 1847, comes up to 18, 1989. One of the characters is uh, there are many historical characters and many um, uh, fictional ones. One of them is Charles Stegart, who actually lived. He uh, infamously is known in India as a man who invented the. Uh, the waterboarding, uh, which uh, Gitmo uh, has uh, now popularized. Now, he did so. I, I couldn't interview him, obviously. He was much decorated, went back to England, died in his own bed. Mm, uh, but I went to the police museum and saw many of the artifacts that were there and things that he possessed. One unexplained article was this rope that was there, and I wondered what it was about. An old man told me that his grandfather, who had worked with Charles Stegart, used that rope to string up people so that they became breathless. This was a method that was, he was told, used in Spain in the Middle Ages. <laughs> uh, Middle Ages? Perhaps not. This was a method that was, I did research, was used during the Spanish Inquisition. Where you are incapable of even crying out in pain, you can only whisper words. That's when you confess. Charles Stegart revived that. Now, you write about people like these, who was very devoted to his wife, Kathleen. He liked good tea. You see? He was uh, an Irishman. And he was a proud Irish, but he was a different kind of Irish from many of the other Irish that I've written about. Enough about that book. Hi. Monsters. Um, more monsters. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I haven't had the sort of intense experience that Vikram clearly has had, kind of dealing with dealing with the, uh, ventriloquizing evil. But there is this... There, you know, if you are going to try and make a believable character, you have to, in some way, inhabit as opposed mm. to merely observe correctly. And you, you know, you do have to sort of draw on whatever parts of yourself you can find that will be uh, extendable into mm -hmm. into the feelings and experiences of such such a character. Um, and I think also, I mean, it's it's been quite instructive for me writing conflict when I when I feel at the beginning of a situation that I know which side I'm on and the duty of the fiction writer is not to mm -hmm. sort of is to try and kind of clear a space where these characters can kind of speak in an, an, an honest way rather than sort of loading the uh, loading the the, 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 the the dice so that one one person's one side's opinion comes out more strongly mm -hmm. um, and often I have found myself I've surprised myself by how convincing you can the be. other side yeah. suddenly is when you give it its proper uh, proper due, and that has yeah I've changed my mind about things because of that that uh, exercise. Yeah, I mean, fiction is a slippery slope in a way because there's nothing that unless you're talking, you're latching yourself onto history or real facts, there is nothing. I mean, you could kill the mother, 
kill the father, bring them back to life. You could do a hundred things, but still you have to maintain your story and your inner honesty towards these people, as you say. Um, I think now it's time to throw it open to questions. Hi, I, this is not uh, so much of a question as uh, just to say that narrating the human condition, uh, poets also narrate the human condition, and the fiction writers of course certainly do. They taught us. Yeah, <laughs> but the, the only thing is that poets do it in a single line, or they're at most two lines, they don't need more than that. And then going back to this, the recent killing in India of this uh, Kalburgi, now had they read Sanskrit, had they read ancient Indian satire? Yeah. of which the clay Sanskrit series has an extraordinary volume, just of satire in Sanskrit. And uh, I read this online, and it says about this man was killed because he was against all kinds of superstition, uh, also the, the sort of uh, sacrifice, uh, jadutona as we call it. There is an old, I don't know what century, certainly a thousand years ago, someone wrote a two-line poem on on the, on the profession of astrology. And, this, and it, the, I think it's, uh, all he says is that it's such a wonderful profession because what you do is you give everyone a long life. Mm -hmm. uh, if he has a long life, he has a long life. If he has a short life, he's not going to come back <laughs> and tell you that he had a short life. Yeah. <laughs> but people were saying this, obviously, thousands of hundreds of years ago. So everyone knew, as we say, everyone knew the score. They, they knew the score then, which is how we've got from there to here. <laughs> you see, if the right wing had been in power 2,500 years ago, we wouldn't have got to where we are today. Here, here. And surely, you know, everyone should learn Sanskrit so they can learn the kinds of things that are there in those in that language. And and the reason I said about you know children being educated, you know, told to recite Sanskrit poetry, I I had indicated that be able to read so much good erotic verse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I've been at the conference uh, yesterday and today, and so far I haven't heard any of the writers address what I'm about to ask, which is uh, I'm a writer and I, I write to discover what, what it is I'm thinking and feeling. I write to flesh out inklings I have, and I write to heal. I write to express something f very deep inside of myself, and I wonder if the panel could speak to how writing fiction uh, is or is not like that for you? Um, I mean, I always believe that, that there has to be an urgent personal reason for writing a novel, because I mean, either way, it's a, it's a long project. You're living for two or three years or more with, with this material. And I, I, I always have some, something I need to find out for myself that lies at the, at the basis of, of why I would take on a particular project rather than anything else that I could potentially write. So to that extent, I, I've, I've, I feel very much in sympathy with your, you know, your feelings about sort of personal excavation. I mean, I, I'm, um, I'm kind of, I'm sort of mildly skeptical of the idea of self-expression, just in, just in general, because it's, it's, it, it's, it's a sort of a phrase that people, people feel they understand self-expression and it's an un unmitigatedly good thing and it's a you know um but there's there's something quite useful as as a fiction writer as well in sort of in suppressing your own first person in 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 um in sidelining that and allowing i mean there are, there are fragments of you and obviously it's it's your creation so in some way it is it is expressive but in in some way just to 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 not not write an un uncomplicated eye, or to write eyes that are uh, from other positions and other places, a discovery kind of kind of eyes as well. So, yeah, it's, I I I feel there's there's a there's a there's a role for sort of T. S. Eliot's notion of kind of almost almost sort of erasing yourself and allowing something to kind of rise up through the through the space. You know, I, I'm I have to say I'm completely driven by curiosity. Um, if there's something that I'm obsessed with and that keeps coming back, then there's energy in that and that's what you want to proceed towards. Um, and I mean curiosity in the sense of the reason I started writing about crime was that I could see in the streets of Bombay the escalation of the violence and the clear influence of crime on 
every aspect of people's lives. Um, three blocks from my house, my father and I were driving home from work one afternoon and we suddenly heard automatic fire echoing from the buildings and there was a gunfight taking place three blocks from where we live. That was, by the way, made into a famous Bollywood movie called Shootout at Lokanwala. <laughs> uh, so, and I had my families in the film industry in India, so they were getting extortion calls from these guys. My brother-in-law is a film producer who's kind of crazy, he refused to pay up. So the next day he had armed guards waiting outside his house and it was weird how quickly we all got used to it. It was like, it just became normal. So then I try, I'm asking why is this happening? I try and figure that out, I start talking to people and then in terms of what you were saying about the novel, it turns out you can't write about organized crime without writing about politics, right? Obviously, I should have known that. And you can't write about politics without talking about religion and the uses of media, right? And then I'm sitting in a very senior police officer's um, office and harassing him with questions. And finally he gets annoyed with me and says, look, I cannot tell you about the shootout at Lokanwala, but you'll never understand what's going on uh, unless you go to Delhi and talk to A, B, and C. And the people that he's talking about are people in the intelligence agencies because of course it turns out that the organized crime organizations are used by every intelligence area, agency in the area to move people and material to do dirty work for them, right? So all of a sudden I'm writing a spy novel as well. So my, <laughs> so my neat little 220 page murder mysteries, <laughs> that's why it grows to 900 pages and that's what the novel does <laughs> particularly well because you, know, you, can, you can then invoke all of these various layers of people's lives and reality and fulfill curiosity. Uh, I can understand people wanting to find that perfect place of finding the perfect pitch of emotion and expecting it to be confirmed by some great power that will reach down and touch you. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that I'm lucky enough that it will ever happen to me. But I can tell you this, I'm curious about stories, I'm curious about trying to tell them and in the process finding out. I'm curious about, for example, in my own family, I, my family had to leave the land that they knew, that they had lived for many generations before that at the drop of a hat and leave everything behind. And when they came to the new land, when they found this house, which was a tiny little rickety structure, they named it after the house that they had left behind because the only thing they could bring with them was the name of the house. Now that is the kind of story that I can identify with, that I can carry inside me and I can deposit on paper. I am content with that. And this is what my stories are about, about losing, finding, people betraying each other, finding out that they have betrayed, and if they are lucky, finding out why they have betrayed. Human condition. <laughs> uh, so you spoke of Julian Huxley's sort of forced into a corner to say that Darwinism is a-religious and, you know, making science a rational rather than a spiritual thing. Do you think Aldous was successful in sort of weaving that back together as he went from religious, or from writing literature and sort of satire of his own culture into moving into the larger questions of humanism? I assume that you are asking me that question, <laughs> since I brought up Julian Huxley. Do you think that debate is ever over? That was only the beginning of the debate. And every time the voice of rationality, or what we call rationality, is raised, uh, there is not a series of answers. We are, in a sense, debating in an echo chamber. And. Uh, other response? Yeah. <laughs> and you think that the origin of whether or not we are descended, uh, I am reminded of William Wilberforce, what he said at that debate, that I am not descended from monkeys. I wonder what he's descended from. <laughs> A bunch of Anglican bishops. <laughs> 
that may be so but the point is that that this idea of descent of of you know it it begs the question of therefore what are you descended from of a kind of a racial purity if you will of whether or not it is genetics as we tragically found out in europe among two pe two peoples who have lived side by side with each other for centuries and they were pogroms in russia in poland etc etc you know john gross's famous book about the village of Jedwabne in which the Catholics and the Jews had lived together in the same little pitiful village in Poland for years, for generations. They all knew each other and so forth. And when they got a chance and they could enact this under the aegis of the Nazi government, they put all of their Jewish neighbors into a barn and sent fire to it and watched it burn to the ground. People have done this, you see who you belong to where you belong to and what you want to what you define yourself as that 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 debate is never over uh, whether it is taking care of you know place in in afghanistan or the in syria today or in modern europe or in india or in africa there you are uh, I, I was just going to say, I, I'm not sure, quite sure I understood the question fully, but I'll answer anyway, because that's what writers do. <laughs> this is about the great debate. Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, I, I was going to say that the, the debate is, again, actually a very ancient one, right? So like Arvind mentioned other traditions in India, the, one of the earliest and powerful traditions is the Charvakas, right? Who were complete materialists, who insisted that man is... Uh, the universe is just atoms bumping up against each other. Uh, doing all your Vedic ritual is completely a waste of time. Um, and that we, consciousness is just an emergent property that emerges when you put atoms together in a particular combination. And when you die, those atoms fall apart and that's it. So just try and have fun. Be a hedonistic, you know, that's what you do. And so they were arguing with the Vedic. Uh, you know, philosophers, they argued with the Buddhists, and we keep doing it. The fun is in the debate, right? And This I mean, is Charvak, the philosopher. philosopher. Yes. And so from, from uh, I mean, the, the saying goes that from the debate emerges the knowing of the essence, but also from the debate emerges a great deal of fun. And I think to avoid discussion, to stop talking, is to take away the great pleasure of actually doing that investigation, which is, I think, uh, I'm a great devotee of pleasure, and I think one should be guided by pleasure. Uh, to avoid that pleasure, I think, is to like walk away from life itself. The interruption of this great debate is when violence takes place. Let the debate continue. 